say thank you in advance to our speakers who've uh, uh, generously agreed uh, to, to give their time, to give you, share some of their thoughts and memories of Harold. Um, but what I wanted to start with uh, was uh, a short-ish uh, clip, which is Harold in Harold's own words. Uh, this was something that Harold put together in 2011 uh, when he was uh, the recipient of the Seal Hatfield Prize. Uh, I'm going to apologise in advance for the cheesy music on the soundtrack. Uh, Harold excelled at many things in life, but the DJing was not one of them. Um, so, uh, without further ado, Harold on Harold. about being involved in aviation because as a child my parents moved very close to the factory and airfield of the Bristol Airplane Company in England and I grew up with the sight and sound of aircraft. As a schoolboy in World War II I devoured everything published about every aircraft flying Know, lots of time for study during air raids. I was much too young to be frightened. I recall only the pure excitement of trying to identify the precise type of bomber caught in the searchlights over Bristol amidst the exploding shells. Inevitably, I joined the local air training corps and air scout troops and when I left school I entered the drawing office of the engine division of Bristol Airplane Company. They were very generous. They allowed me to complete my apprenticeship by spending two years at College of Aeronautics at Cranfield. In addition to formal studies and research we had flying lessons and I can report that Fortunately for the whole of mankind, I did not progress beyond my first solo in a Tiger Moth biplane. After leaving Cranfield, I was the youngest in a small group of engineers, aeronautical engineers, who formed the Air Safety and Survey Division of the British Aviation Insurance Company in London. One day, the big white chief, Captain A.G. Lamplew, came into our office and said, one of you should know about the law. And he pointed at me. I was 23 years old. I took it as an instruction. That was not too difficult. In those days, I was traveling around the world, my piston engine aircraft, lots of time to study. I studied part-time and ultimately became a member of the English Bar. In this way, although I was employed, I became the first in-house lawyer in the London aviation insurance market. I began to specialize in the legal liabilities of the complete aviation industry around the world. And the wonderful part of my job was meeting the leading defense lawyers around the world on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, one of my earliest bits of good fortune was meeting a young lawyer called George Tompkins. He was then 
the newest associate in a firm that dealt mainly with regulatory matters in those days, Condon and Forsyth. Since that time, when I met George in the late 50s, uh, he has defended probably more Warsaw cases than any other lawyer on earth. He introduced me to Lee Kreindler, uh, U.S. plaintiff's lawyer, who was highly regarded, but I was very uneasy about meeting a U.S. plaintiff lawyer because in London in those days, U.S. plaintiff's lawyers were generally regarded as, well, regarded by insurers that is, as an un unavoidable, forum shopping, greedy bunch of bandits driven by a distasteful contingent fee system which relentlessly generated outrageous jury awards of damages. It was therefore a very pleasant surprise to discover that Lee Kreindler was a truly gentle man with a warm personality and a passion for justice. I owe a great deal to the Royal Aeronautical Society in London, the oldest aeronautical society in the world, because in just about 50 years ago, the society formed an air law group in response to a suggestion that I made at a main lecture. Becoming a member of that group became a badge of specialization, facilitated what today is known as networking. But I'd like to make it absolutely clear that whatever reputation I may have enjoyed in relation to aviation law, it was inevitably enhanced by the caliber of outstanding young lawyers who worked with me over the years. I am truly thankful to them. As Harold said, uh, not necessarily just historically, uh, uh, U.S. plaintiffs' lawyers uh, have often been regarded as the enemy, and one of Harold's unique abilities was the ab ability to bridge that divide uh, without incurring the wrath or paranoia of the defendants uh, who he represented. Um, Lee Kreinder, of course, is no longer with us. He passed on the reins of his business to his son, uh, Jim Kreindler. Uh, Jim can't join us today because, much to the consternation, no doubt, of the insurers in the room, Jim is in trial in Washington at the moment, no doubt securing another outrageous jury award. Um, but he did uh, send a short message, uh, which uh, was this. Like so many of you, Harold has been a pillar in my personal and professional life for decades. Harold and Isabel attended my bar mitzvah. While so many know Harold as a pillar of intellectual strength, one of his many Herculean feats was carrying me on his shoulders on my first visit to the UK. Truth be known, that was some time before I tipped the scales at 230 pounds. As a young lawyer, Harold was a mentor and inspiration. There was no one wiser, more insightful, more thoughtful, more fair-minded, better informed, or more inspiring than Harold. Speaking with Harold was always a profound experience. Being with Isabel and Harold was always a delight and pleasure. His voice, his expressions, and his searing commentary are indelibly etched in my memory. <clears throat> I will miss him greatly and could never forget the many conversations that made him so dear to me and my parents. Uh, sentiments that I'm sure we would all echo. Uh, 
One of the things Harold did throughout his career uh, in uh, insurance and insurance law was to establish a small firm called IIS uh, back in the 70s. Uh, IIS, uh, stable of young lawyers, uh, almost universally went on to achieve great things uh, in their own right. Uh, and so I'm delighted to say that our first speaker is one of those once young lawyers. <laughs> Uh, who was introduced to what he calls the Flying Circus uh, by Harold uh, and uh, started an illustrious career under him. Uh, and that is Mr. Neil McGilchrist. So, Neil, if I could ask you to take the stand. I first met Harold in the early 70s when we were both serving members of a committee of a body called the Bar Association for Commerce, Finance and Industry. It was a lobby group for employed barristers. At that time I was playing with ships and I was well aware from remarks he made out with meetings that Harold played with aeroplanes and they were always my first love. So I suggested to Harold that it would be sensible for him to employ me. Looking very serious, he said there are, there are two reasons why it would make absolutely no sense whatever for me to employ you. The first is the very strange nature of the organization that I run, International Insurance Services. It defies categorization. The closest you can say is perhaps it is a firm of liability loss adjusters. But it's intended as a group of non-practicing lawyers. Non-practicing because we have to watch out that we don't infringe the provisions of the restrictive trade practices of the Solicitors Act. The second reason why I shouldn't employ you is I don't have any work for you. I indicated that the first reason didn't bother me. I had never thought the Solicitors Act was very effective at uh, protecting the solicitor's profession. As to the second, we agreed that I could have a job for six months. And as he put it, if it's to last any longer, you have to go out in the street and get the work for yourself. And so I joined up and, and was with Harold for seven years. It was a very difficult time for Harold, in a sense. He mentioned the Air Safety Survey Division, of course, of British Aviation Insurance Company. He, in that capacity as lawyer to that body, was effectively Mr. Aviation Claims in London. The BIC insured a very large proportion of the major risks, and Harold was instrumentally deeply engaged in, in claims handling. Now, it's, it's not a subject for today. The reasons why he left BIC and IIS was started, but Air Claims was formed to, to take on some of the tasks that ASSD was performing. Uh, there was something of a falling out with the, the chief underwriter of BIC. So Harold, in effect, had to start over. And that was not easy. He was shunned indeed initially by the BIC um, and in the early days of IIS the support that he found came largely from overseas from the European markets and lawyers and indeed from those in the United States and my early experience of working with Harold was the amazing number of august foreign market and, and legal dignitaries who beat a path to Harold's door when they were in London. I say to Harold's door, actually it was more often to the door of restaurants which in those days had white crisp tablecloths um, and, you know, served the, 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 Lloyd's, uh, the Lloyd's community. It was a fascinating time to be an observer of these conversations Harold was very generous in inviting me uh, frequently along because it was a year after the first 
wide body catastrophe, Turkish Airlines DC-10 Paris. And there was a surprising segment of the market that had hysterics that the world as they knew it had ended um, and there were suggestions that limits should be torn up, the public wouldn't, wouldn't wear even such claims being defended because of the uh, unpleasantness of the event. And, and Harold talked a lot of uh, calm rationality um, and, and helped sort of calm uh, some of these fears. But why was there such enthusiasm for Harold? And what was it that brought people to listen to him, apart from his prior reputation from BIC days? Well, clearly his character and his personality. And I wrote down a few words. Idiosyncratic, integrity, imagination, intellect. And these all wrapped up in a generosity of spirit that was deep and I think is well reflected in the photograph of him which appears on the face of the invitation. Uh, to this event. And in addition to this, also wrapping up this package was his passion for air law. Now I would like in a few moments just to briefly touch on one or two um, uh, examples of my memories associated with the, these different features. Idiosyncrasy. I was pleased to see in the film the sartorial trademark the peaked cap, which Harold wore almost all the time. Some people felt that it made him look like the skipper of a Caribbean tuna boat, but Harold always felt it was more the look of a bus conductor. But he was very attached to it. But he also had a self-deprecating, understated, dry wit that was all, so often on display and was, was a delight to be, to be exposed to. Now, my second I word was independence, but I'm going to run independence and integrity together. Harold never compromised his principles, and he was fearless in defending the interests of his clients. Now, that may sound like a, an obvious proposition to put vis-a-vis -vis a lawyer, but at that time, the, I'm, I hope I'm not going to offend too many people by saying this, that the market was essentially controlled by the brokers. And the brokers did not always fully understand the daily conflict of interest which they faced between their representation of their client insurance buyer and the role they performed in oiling the wheels of the market for the underwriters. But Harold was always absolutely clear in his insistence that he represented the insurers. Now, I had only been with Harold about a fortnight when he asked me to join him at a meeting. I said, I don't know anything about this matter. Why, why do you want me to come with you? He said, I think I'm going to need a witness. And he took me to meet a very well-known figure who was chairman um, of a broken house who spent 10 minutes telling Harold how he intended to destroy his business and his uh, reputation uh, through an action for defamation and various other good things. I began to wonder what exactly it was that I had joined. But Harold was, was quite unperturbed by this and I guess prepared me for the next meeting I had with the chair of an insurance broking house, so this time possibly the most powerful insurance broker in the aviation environment in North America. Harold had been asked to conduct some inquiries into certain pieces of business uh, that this broking house had been uh, associated with, and the uh, president uh, of the broking company wanted to explain to Harold in advance why this was all completely unnecessary, of course, and he proceeded needed to uh, indulge in a little homily to this effect. When he finished, there was silence for a little, and then Harold looked at him and said, heifer dust. And the broker didn't 
initially appreciate that that was what had been said to him. He found it hard to believe that anyone could have expressed such words in his presence. So he got up and walked out. But the point was that even although Harold's business in other respects may have suffered because he wasn't towing the broker's line, he was absolutely fearless. And the business that he did develop was on the back of those who knew that he was completely trustworthy. He had great imagination. He kept coming up with ideas, many of which perhaps did not bear ultimate fruition. He worked with Scandia on the notion of introducing mandatory personal accident insurance onto the airline ticket. He came up with plans for um, agreed valuation of, of hulls in a way that would have reduced insurance costs. And he was one of the early instigators, one of the early developers of the, the concept of risk management as applied to aviation. And certainly one of my great pleasures working with him was the, the, the risk management assignments, much more challenging than dealing with a claim, the claim, the aircraft's broken, burning, or whatever in a field, you deal with the consequences. But to anticipate um, and, and um, head off future problems clearly uh, is more difficult. And I, I remember I, I owed Harold one particularly wonderful week. Uh, there was an underwriter at Lloyd's who insured uh, contamination due to crop spraying chemicals going uh, off the field uh, where, where they were uh, intended to treat the crop. And this was the only gentleman, I think, at the time who provided this coverage in, in the world. And so a lot of people came to him. He had a particular problem in Israel, um, very intensive cultivation, lots of use of chemicals, treated from the air, uh, multiple claims. So I was asked by Harold to go to, um, to, to Israel and observe and report. Um, it was challenging, but it was fascinating. It was in the aftermath of the uh, Six-Day War, and I was being flown in a, I think even then, 50-year-old Piper car, but about 500 feet over gun emplacements and tank parks up the Jordan Valley. Uh, quite memorable, although that wasn't what I was perhaps supposed to be doing. The intellect, well, I think we can all recognize the razor-sharp intellect and the meticulous attention to detail that was associated with it. Harold would plan minutely for any task entrusted to him, um, any negotiation, any speech. He loved words and working around words on paper. His meticulous approach was one of the reasons why he, I think, developed quite a substantial business in the investigation and um, reviewing of the conduct of binding authorities. Again, brokers, all powerful, given pens by underwriters to go and write risks on their behalf, and sometimes the broker's uh, enthusiasm maybe carried them a little away. And I, and I share, it's, it's, a, it's a tale that has stayed with me, and, I, and I, if you bear with me, I may run on two or three minutes more than my allotted time, but I, I share it. There was a particular binder that uh, the underwriter thought was insuring uh, executive jets. Well, Dr. Ziegelbaum was a medical doctor in the United States who wanted to learn how to hang glide. And so he went to a hang gliding school that was actually insured on this particular cover. And having been suitably equipped and trained, he was encouraged to leap off the edge of the cliff. But unfortunately, as he did so, the helmet, which was too big, dropped down and covered his eyes. So he effected a blind landing. He wasn't seriously hurt, but he made a very big fuss. Uh, and, and this somehow encapsulated things that 
were perceived to be questionable about this binding authority. And the degree of detail in which uh, this was all analyzed by Harold was impressive. I mentioned generosity of spirit. Well, I think I'm a testament to that. When I left Harold's employ to go and work for, for Beaumont's, I had only been there a week when the uh, aspirant senior partner, the, the second partner, said to me, you know, Neil, you know more people in the insurance market than anybody in Beaumont's apart from the senior partner, John Brooks. And that was a direct testament. Harold was completely open, drew me in, encouraged me, no holding back. I owed him a great deal. And his passion for air law, of course, we are all very familiar with that. I guess international air law really evolved from, emanated from the Warsaw Convention, which was devised to protect the nascent industry. And of course, when Harold came on the scene, as it were, BIC in the 50s, that protection was moving into the insurance environment. Insurance was more available than it had been in the 30s. And so Harold's legal skill combined with his, both his technical knowledge, because he was better able to, to assess risks than, than many other underwriters, um, and um, his, his insurance expertise having been sort of hands-on within the, within the business meant that he had a, a, a fountain of a, his fundaments of knowledge which made his insights into the evolving um, air law environment um, and the, the legal regimes for air carriage particularly poignant. Now, I would like to finish, if I may, with one anecdote, which is actually Harold's own. Um, I am sure it is precisely correct, because I, I rem always remembered this, but last week I did try to identify the actual case and I couldn't, um, but it was in the early 50s, so maybe that was the reason. There was an aircraft inbound over the southern Sahara into Dakar. It disappeared. Harold was dispatched, I'm not sure whether from London or whether he was in the vicinity, but he arrived, as I understand it, in Dakar around the time, it's about two, maybe 36 hours after the event, um, he, uh, the, the, the uh, location of the aircraft was essentially by this time known, at least approximately. So a land convoy was being put together to go up, um, but a helicopter was, was going out with some sort of emergency support. Harold hitched a ride on the helicopter. The helicopter reached the aircraft and immediately became unserviceable. So Harold had become a victim of an accident that he had been sent out to investigate. He wasn't too troubled because, excuse me, he knew that um, help was on the way, but he said, of course, dehydration was an issue. Um, he said, I only realized how badly I was affected by the event as I was sitting in the Jeep being driven, open-sided Jeep being driven back down to Dakar. He said, because I was sitting there and I was, I had a large money roll in my pocket. And I sat there watching the notes one by one flowing out of my pocket into the desert sand. And he said, I didn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, final sequel to that was he also sold the salvage remains of the aircraft. It was not in bad order. I think it had run out of fuel and made an emergency landing. Um, sold the wreckage to a salvage company. They went out three weeks later. All disappeared. The site had been stripped clean. Well, whether or not there were a large number of metal Bedouin tents uh, in the area, I know not. But I do understand that the very unhappy salvage buyer, but of course it was caveat emptor, so he didn't really have a comeback, um, he went into a cinema in Dakar, and lo and behold, there were the seats. Um, <laughs> anyway, I digress a little, but I, I personally have hugely enjoyed my own career in aviation insurance and the law, 
and that would not have been possible or happened without Harold. So I wish myself very much to honour his memory. Thank you, Neil. Uh, our next speaker is another uh, stalwart or former stalwart of the Beaumont stable, um, John Balfour, who is now, I think, semi-retired, uh, if not properly retired, after a very long and distinguished career uh, in aviation law uh, at Beaumont, of course, as with Neil, uh, then Clyde's. Uh, John is a fellow of the society here, uh, as well as doing all sorts of other things. I think at one stage he's been an advisor to NATO, uh, as well as being on the advisory board uh, of the University at Leiden at the Institute of Air and Space Law there. So, John, if I could invite you to take the stand. Uh, thank you, Tim, for that kind introduction. And thank you also to you and Quadrant Chambers and the Society for this opportunity to share a few memories of Harold. Uh, Obviously, not uh, having worked alongside him as Neil did, I don't have as many uh, memories as, as Neil, um, but having worked in air law for over 30 years, one could not fail to come across Harold frequently uh, and uh, often to very good effect. Looking back at the earlier encounters, I think two stand out in, in particular. Uh, one was when I first saw his histrionic talents, and I think Isabel may remember this too, when I saw him take the part of uh, someone, one of the actors in a mock trial uh, at an aviation conference in Washington. I can't remember exactly when, but I think in the mid-80s, and he played his part superbly. Uh, the, the other uh, encounter I remember in those early years was perhaps less entertaining, but uh, striking, in the context of a proposed co-chairing agreement between Alitalia and Japan Airlines. Now, Neil mentioned that uh, Harold um, uh, created a great uh, impression on many foreign clients and markets, and among those, I think, uh, was Generali, and I think through that connection, he came to act for Alitalia. Uh, on the Japan Airlines side was Peter Martin, whose uh, young assistant I had the honor to be at the time. And the two of them came together to uh, discuss the terms of this agreement. Um, uh, and they did, uh, unfortunately, have a few differences of opinion, mostly on liability issues. And these were expressed largely in correspondence, uh, which can date it, I think. Remember correspondence? Uh, so it's the pre-internet age in the late 80s. Uh, and as far as I remember, it certainly showed Harold's tenacity in uh, keeping to what he thought was the right position, and if I remember rightly, succeeding with it. Over the ensuing years, he was a constant presence uh, in my life, uh, both uh, for the articles and written work that he produced on a variety of topics, uh, increasingly on new subjects which attracted his attention uh, I mentioned just one in particular, the dreaded subject of passenger rights. Um, <clears throat> uh, also, of course, he was an indefatigable attender at conferences, happily, very often, with Isabel at his side. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been to conferences, as I have, when the moderator of a panel asks after the presenters have given their um, presentations for questions from the floor and a deafening silence ensues, quickly covered up by the moderator with some prepared questions he's prepared just for that eventuality. Well, that never happened at a conference which Harold attended. Uh, I don't recall one at which he didn't come up with uh, some question or comment. And he could always be relied on to make a comment, comment which uh, was uh, often uh, insightful, uh, sometimes controversial, and always at least stimulating. The last time I saw him, in fact, and also uh, Isabel too, was at a conference, the European Air Law Conference in Edinburgh in November last year. 
And Nikki is probably going to say more about this, so I won't, but I was uh, delighted to be part of the committee of the European Air Law Association, which decided to give Harold uh, the award, um, the Lifetime Achievement Award at The Hague in 2009, and also uh, to be present at a similar occasion uh, in Florida, where Isabel was present too, that has been referred to earlier, uh, when he was awarded the Cecile Hatfield Award in 2011. Uh, my last uh, real encounter with him, in fact, took place in this very room and uh, uh, around it, um, because for a number of years, uh, I was the honorary solicitor of the Royal Aeronautical Society, a great honor. Uh, Harold, as we've heard, was uh, the founder of the Air Law Group, uh, a long-standing uh, member and fellow, and rightly uh, took a very close interest in the society's affairs. So when the society decided in, I think it was 2010, to uh, make an amendment to its bylaws, as it does from time to time, uh, he, he expressed a close interest in them. Uh, he was a, uh, a great scrutineer of a lot of the detail, which it had to be said others had missed, and made a number of good and helpful comments. Some, perhaps, uh, which uh, we may have differed on, uh, but overall uh, it was a, a helpful contribution, and it certainly may, made for the only interesting annual general meeting of the society that I can ever remember. Um, <clears throat> Not long ago, the society went through um, another amendment to its bylaws, and my successor as honorary solicitor, uh, Patrick Slomsky, um, asked me, um, knowing that there'd been a previous amendment, asked me if I had any advice. So I thought for a moment and said, well, just, just one thing. I mean, make sure that they'll get past Harold. Well, sadly, this was... Um, while Harold was still with us. Sadly, in fact, Harold was not there at the meeting to discuss these, uh, but I think Patrick did heed my advice, and I'm fairly certain that the amendments would have passed uh, and met with his approval. Harold, I think, um, will have me left many memorable legacies, but if I can suggest one, perhaps small in its way, legacy, it is this, uh, that if and when the society comes to amend its bylaws again in the future, they should take as a cardinal rule uh, to remember the question, and would Harold have approved this? Um, so I, I'd like to pay tribute to, to Harold uh, for the, the great enlightenment that he's provided with me over more, over more than 30 years in my air law career, and to express my best wishes and condolences to Isabel. Thank you, John. Um, well, of course, one of the things that Harold particularly liked about air law was the exposure it, it gave him to uh, international lawyers, not just uh, English lawyers. And I'm delighted to welcome one of those international lawyers as our next speaker, uh, Nikki Ehlers. As you may have heard John just mention, very active within the European Air Law Association uh, as a German lawyer. Uh, Nikki was responsible for some very memorable conferences in Munich, amongst other places. Uh, well, they would have been memorable if he didn't always time them to coincide with Oktoberfest. Um, so on that note, if I can ask Nikki to come up and say a few words. Well, dear Isabel and dear friends of Howard Kaplan, it's a great privilege and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to contribute uh, to uh, this wonderful gathering in which we are remembering and honoring our friend Harold Kaplan. I'm echoing Neil when I say that I've always greatly enjoyed to be an aviation lawyer and meeting Harold as well as you Isabel certainly was one of the best things of the many good things that happened to me in my career um, in this field. You were there together, of course, when I attended my first international conference organized by George Tompkins 
in a magnificent hotel in the Austrian Alps near Innsbruck. And um, you were still there together again when I attended my second last conference, already mentioned by John, the last annual conference of the European Airline Association in Edinburgh last November. We all know, and uh, Nia has already referred to it, how passionate Harold was when it came to aviation. And this passion is what made him such a credible and at the same time such an incredible professional. The letter in which Harold thanked for the Lifetime Achievement Award he had received from the European Airline Association in 2009, the first such award since um, it was created, bears witness to this passion. Harold wrote, as you noted, aviation has been my overriding passion, born when I was a schoolboy in the Second World War. But I did not choose to be a lawyer. That was the choice of my, big, my first big boss, Captain Lamplew, underwriter of the British Aviation Insurance Company. Passion was one facet of Harold's character. Another one was his eagerness to learn, to learn from books and to learn from other people. And he never held back in to praise those that inspired him. In the same thank you note that I mentioned, he expressed his indebtedness to such greats as Professor Bin Cheng, the late American plaintiff's lawyer, Lee Kreindler, George Tompkins, and Lauren Clark, another recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award of the European Air Law Association. Harold wrote about these great lawyers and uh, some others that um, uh, he had referred to that he is eternally indebted to them and that they are the giants on whose shoulders he has stood, referring, of course, to Isaac Newton, who once said, if I see further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. The end of that letter shows that Harold was also able to make fun of himself, and I quote, he had um, commented on the award and said, it is not simply that it is rather more pleasant to enjoy an encomium than to hope for a posthumous eulogy. Today, of course, he has to sustain a number of those eulogies. And he continued, it is the exhilarating evaporation of self-doubt and the realization that I have been given a tangible symbol of appreciation of those I most respect. Of equal importance, it has persuaded Isabel that I might occasionally continue to work on cherished projects even if it slows the process of clearing the domestic chaos which I have created. Just as uh, Harold never stopped studying and never stopped learning, we never stopped learning from him. You could um, even learn from him that a serious man can wear a pink shirt and a pink tie without appearing less serious. In conclusion, I would like to quote from another note um, from Harold's, which he sent after uh, the two of you had returned um, from the Edinburgh conference uh, last November, um, where uh, he had met many old friends, many young friends in um, this message uh, he referred to a, um, a conversation 
um, with um, the um, Indonesian uh, winner of the EALA Award, um, a wonderful uh, colleague. And um, then uh, he continued to write, everyone was so helpful and kind. They could readily see our physical frailty, but it was a most rewarding experience. Neither of us had visited Edinburgh before. In fact, I can only remember visiting Scotland once before in September, October 1948, when as a very junior aeronautical engineer, I was sent by aviation insurers to inspect the wreckage of a KLM constellation spread across hills northeast of Prestwick Airport. Unforgettable. I wish you <coughs> every success with the next EALA event, but I doubt whether we will be able to make it. We now know that Harold will not be <coughs> in Warsaw at the next annual conference of the European Air Law Association. But um, the only thing that will be missing is his physical presence. He will be there in spirit, and he will be there in our hearts. And so I would like to end not saying farewell, but au revoir, and may he rest in peace. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nikki. Um, now, we're going to have a bit of a break from lawyers uh, for a moment. Uh, our next speaker is John Tilling. Um, John uh, was an underwriter at Lloyd's for many years, aviation insurance and reinsurance. Uh, he had the joys of living through the Lloyd's crash, uh, reconstruction and renewal, uh, and unusually for an underwriter, perhaps, had the foresight to employ Harold as a consultant uh, for many years uh, after R&R &R, uh, and, uh, uh, and use him in that capacity, which was somewhat innovative, I have to say. Uh, so if I could, John, ask you to come up and say a few words. Uh, Tim, thank you for those very kind words. I hardly recognize myself, actually. Um, <clears throat> Like the other guest speakers and your good selves, I'm here to pay my very best respects to our dear friend Harold. Unlike the majority of you here, as you've heard from Tim, I'm not from the legal profession. My background is insurance, and I was an underwriter at Lloyd's uh, involved in aviation insurance and reinsurance. I can't recall uh, the exact date and year that I met Harold, but I first became aware of Harold because as a youth, I sat on an underwriting box and I was given a number of papers written by Harold for me to absorb and begin to understand what I'd let myself in for. This prepared me for my career, my future, and to try and embrace aviation with the same passion that Harold did. Some years later, I experienced a, um, a little local difficulty, and my first instinct and my first choice was to contact Mr. Kaplan. As you would expect, our first face-to-face -face, -face meeting was in the coffee lounge in the old Lloyd's building, where I explained my predicament. After a series of searching questions, Mr. Kaplan retreated to consider my position and subsequently deliver his advice. From our next meeting, I began to understand the reputation that Harold so richly deserved. Harold's a man of remarkable qualities, quite unique, but above all that, he's kind and gentle. He's very humorous and he's very honest. He listens without interruption, asks pertinent questions to the problem, and considers the position. But here comes his uniqueness, a clear and unequivocal analysis of the problem in question, 
and delivered in the most concise way, whether it be in my favor or not, but laying out a clear strategy to solve the problem. His deliverance, both written and spoken, is drawn from his vast knowledge of law, just not aviation law, but international law and all other aspects in different jurisdictions. But he's infectious. The way that he delivers uh, is in such a measured and serene way that it really almost hypnotizes you. It's, I've never come across it before. It's quite wonderful. It was a joy to experience his use of the English language in its construction and the extent of the vocabulary. His politeness was ever present, generous with his time and efforts in order to try and help not only me, but my colleagues and anyone else who showed any interest in the business. He gave tremendous support to people around, to me and people around me, regardless of their station in life, he was always there. His presence was infectious, and he never allowed me to get disheartened. Sometimes there are times when you think, why on earth am I here? But he never allowed me to get that depressed. There was never ever a crossword or a put down. If there had been, and there never was, the put down would have been so subtle that it would have gone straight over my head anyway. So. But from our early beginnings, our friendship grew, and he became a retained consultant to the syndicate for many years, assisting in any disputes, fortunately quite few, and the drafting of numerous clauses which were adopted in the marketplace and are still in regular use today. In recent times, Howard and myself, together with another future friend, have met regularly for lunch, learning of and discussing developments in the marketplace. These lunches were a rich feeding ground for both Harold and myself, in more senses than one, of course, you've only got to look at me. And I was able to educate, and he was able to educate his limited audience in his usual constructive manner, pointing out potential pitfalls. I've been very conscious to try and find the right eloquent, word, eloquent words to reflect all of Harold's fine qualities. <coughs> but confess that I've fallen short. Simply to conclude <clears throat> that I shall miss him beyond words can describe. I shall miss him, his humor, his intellect, his counsel. I shall miss our regular lunches and I shall miss his appearance wearing his distinctive hat and colorful bow ties. The finest of gentlemen who has been my privilege to call my friend. Thank you very much, John. Um, our last speaker today is Robert Lawson, QC. Uh, Robert was, of course, foolish enough to uh, find a place for me at Quadrant Chambers when I left Lloyd's to go to the bar. Um, but apart from that spectacular lapse in judgment, uh, he's generally pretty sound. Uh, so, uh, Rob, if I could ask you to come and round off today. Thank you, Tim. As he rightly says, there are things in life one regrets, and I apologise to the legal community for Tim. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can I begin by thanking the chairman of the AIR Law Group for helping to organize this event, Mark Ninkovic, but in particular his vice chairman, or as I always like to think in his chairman of vice, Tim Marland, both for his organization, his comparing here today as master of ceremonies, and in particular for his wonderful obituary that's on the society's website. Um, do have a look if you haven't seen it. It's so nice to see so ma many familiar faces here today, and especially, of course, Isabel. Thank you all very much for coming. That done, I think it's apt to start with Harold's immortal and killer words. 
so often used in this society. And I have to lower my voice for this. Mr. Chairman. Which, as many of us know to our cost, was then always followed by an assassination, or at least a deflation, delivered in the politest and most gentlemanly of terms. Because Harold held us all to account. He was our conscience, and as we've already heard, he was very much revered as such. Although, of course, in many instances, that was done through gritted teeth. But everyone needs a Harold, and the aviation world was better for being blessed with him. Today is a celebration of Harold's life, and I'm not going to eulogize about his many great achievements and qualities, because that's already been done, if I may say so, to an excellent uh, standard by all concerned. What I thought I would do in bringing this to a close was to tell you a little story which is appropriate on many, many levels, not least on this historic day. At 9.29 hours, on the 3rd of February 2014, I received an email from Harold. I have to read it to you in full for reasons that will become apparent. The subject, help. I am writing with tears in my eyes. I and my family presently on a short trip in Rome, Italy. Unfortunately, I was rubbed in the hotel I booked. All my valuables, which includes cash, cell phones, were stolen during the attack. But luckily, I still have my passport with me. I've been to the embassy and the police here, but they are not taking the matter seriously. Please. I really need your financial assistance now because things are getting really tough on me here. Our flight leaves in a few hours from now, but we're having problems settling the hotel bills and the hotel manager won't let us leave until we settle the bills. Please, let me know if you can help us out. I'll really appreciate your prompt response. Regards, H. I think you'll all agree that that was a desperate, heart-rendering plea. It was also clearly an email sent to everyone on Harold's address book, because several responded immediately, and so I saw what they thought. And their universal response was exactly the same as my immediate thought. Harold, your email account has been hacked. How did we know? Well, that was easy. Harold, as we've already heard, was a stickler for good grammar and politeness. And he simply would not write a letter in such loose, direct, and colloquial terms. And he certainly never had a cell phone. <laughs> and I also happened to know that at that time, he was on a cruise in the Caribbean with Isabel. Anyway, weeks passed, and I thought nothing further about it. I then received an email from Harold, sent also to a few other people in this room, Pia, uh, uh, Mia and uh, Lorn, you were on the list and may remember this. Subject line, all for your delight. 
it attached an email from the European Ombudsman. The email said, Dear Mr. Kaplan, please find attached a letter from the European Ombudsman related to your complaint, the registry. The attached letter must be read in full. It is a masterpiece of which, yes, Minister would be proud. It said this, and I apologize, it's slightly longer than I would like. Complaint 284-2014-HK. Dear Mr. Kaplan, I am writing in reply to your letter of 3rd February 2014, in which you complained that you were robbed while on a trip to Rome with your family. You stated that you lost all his valuables, including cash and mobile phones. According to you, the embassy and police did not treat your matter seriously. Thereafter, you asked me for financial assistance in settling the hotel bills. The Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union and the Statute of the European Ombudsman set certain conditions concerning the opening of an inquiry by the Ombudsman. One of these conditions is that the Ombudsman shall help to uncover maladministration in the activities of the Union institutions, bodies, offices and agencies. No action by any other authority or person may be subject of a complaint to the Ombudsman. After a careful consideration of your complaint, it appears that this condition is not met because your complaint is not related to an act of a union, institution, body, office or agency. I regret to inform you, therefore, that the European Ombudsman is not entitled to deal with your complaint. In addition, I would like to note that the European Ombudsman cannot provide financial assistance to any individual or entity. If you consider that your complaint does, in fact, concern an act of a union, institution, body, office, or agency, you are, of course, welcome to send us relevant additional information or comments that may clarify the object of your complaint. You're also free to make a reasoned request for a review of my factual finding that your complaint does not concern an EU institution, body, or office. If you choose to do so, please indicate precisely which institution, body, office, or agency you consider to have been involved. Such a reasoned request for review will be examined by the Ombudsman. Yours sincerely, Peter Boner, Head of the Registry. Note that this letter was responded to a complaint made only three weeks before. The European Ombudsman was, of course, on Harold's email address book because he had previously held it successfully to account. Only Harold could elicit such a diligent and timely response from the mighty bureaucracy of Brussels. It's nice to know that they don't squander our money. <laughs> like you, I will miss Harold greatly. My life was much richer for his company and for the education he gave me. I am very grateful for that, and I share with all the desire that he rests very fondly in peace. Thank you.